so welcome also to everyone uh, in Leuven uh, who is watching this and, and perhaps around the world uh, on a special evening to honor uh, two Pauls, uh, two professors, two distinguished professors, uh, Professor Paul de Graue and Professor Paul Krugman. Uh, you might wonder why are we gathering uh, the two uh, Pauls here tonight? Uh, there is a good reason for that, if you believe it. Uh, it is because actually they've had a long-standing, can I call it, academic friendship um, of over 40 years, I understand, uh, about 40 years, mm -hmm. yeah. that uh, culminated uh, to a visit, in a visit uh, of Professor uh, Krugman to uh, Professor de Graue and the KU Leuven in 1990 or 1991, we weren't sure. Uh, exact, exactly. Pretty but it was sure it was 90, but sorry. 1990. Sorry. 1990. <laughs> um, and so we're going to be t talking about your lives, about your academic careers. And they span, of course, uh, let's say the whole uh, post war, uh, war uh, sorry, post war uh, international economic order, because Professor de Grauwe, you were born in 1946. And yeah, uh, for a couple of years, I was not aware of the world. <laughs> 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 uh, and by the time that you were aware of the world, then Professor Krugman was born in 1953. That right. we do know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so it's quite remarkable that we are able to talk to you both about that. And I want to take you on that uh, journey uh, with me. Um, and the first thing I want to ask, because you know, you of course now are distinguished professors, Nobel Prize winner, uh, a pre-science uh, professor who saw the European debt crisis coming. But of course, it didn't start out that way. Um, and I want to ask you about the beginning of your lives when you were young. Of course, you had to make a choice of what to study. Do you remember uh, why you decided to study economics? Economics or economics? Yeah. Paul, why don't you go first? Oh, I. <laughs> well, I came second, but the. Uh, well, I actually, my my story is actually funny. Um, I was a very uh, a very nerdy. Uh, young man, and, uh, and in, in high school I read science fiction, and I don't know if anybody here has ever read Isaac Asimov. There's a classic trilogy oh, of okay. novels called the Foundation series, which is about mathematical social scientists who saw who saved galactic civilization. Very exciting. And I wanted to be one of those guys. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's it. That's where that was my entry. Um, and so that got you uh, into uh, wanting to go to university and... Uh, well, I wanted to go to university anyway, but it, it, it was one of the reasons I, I took some economics and, uh, and then uh, just found it a appealing and, and, found, and found a mentor, which is always crucial. Yeah. And is that the same for you? I mean, were you a science fiction no, fan? Nothing then, or? to do with science fiction. I mean, I think it's more prosaic. Um, I, I wanted to, to go into social sciences. That was clear to me. And then, you know, in Leuven, the first two years, you, you could actually do everything in social sciences, um, economics, sociology, political science, and everything. So I was hesitating a lot between actually economics and sociology. And so one day I got up, I would get up uh, and think, it's going to be economics. The next day, it's going to be sociology. And then someday I had to decide, and it happened to be economics. Yeah. Um, what would have happened if you studied sociology? <laughs> I don't know. What we would have happened to the world? Here. We will certainly not be here. No, I think uh, I, I still like this, this, this idea that in economics, we, we should be um, interested in other things than pure economics. Huh? Of course. I mean, Soci sociology, political science, these are important dimensions that we often miss in economics. But yeah. 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 Um, now, when you started uh, your careers, your, uh, you did, of course, college or university education first, and then uh, you went to do a doctorate or a PhD. And uh, it was a special time when, when both of you entered the field as professors or as, as PhD students. Uh, I think it was the end of the 60s, and then uh, in the early 70s, uh, a lot of turmoil in the global economy. If uh, people remember, of course, it was the time of the oil crises. Did that at all affect uh, your uh, choice of, of your work or your vision on, uh, on the world? Well, for me, very much so, because the, uh, it was not just the oil crisis, but it was also the collapse of the Bretton Woods uh, international monetary system, the coming of fluctuating exchange rates. So the world was, uh, the world economy was a crazy place. I remember, I remember thinking, things are really crazy now. They'll never be this crazy again. Of course, they <laughs> kept on getting crazier. But the, uh, uh, but it was, it, it, international stuff was suddenly very prominent. And uh, 
I had the very good luck in, in um, graduate school to, uh, we had, MIT had recently hired uh, Rudy Dornbusch, the great uh, German, German uh, economist who was exciting, and, and it, it seemed like a natural thing to follow. Uh, I will say, by the way, at the time, very few Americans did international economics. It was just, you know, we have a congenital problem in this country of not really believing that the rest of the world exists. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and at the time I entered the field, it was, there were Europeans, but there were also an awful lot of Canadians and Australians, uh, and very few Americans. It, was, it wasn't until about five years into my career that I realized it was possible to get to a conference without drinking enormous amounts of beer. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, Rudiger Dornbusch, of course, uh, did that. Uh, no, he didn't, but the Canadians and the Australians <laughs> I did. see. Okay. <laughs> All right. We got that reference wrong. Uh, but it was quite interesting because uh, you studied, indeed, uh, at MIT, and, and, and if you look at the people you studied with, it's uh, today it's a sort of a veritable who's who uh, yeah. of economic uh, policy making in the world. You mentioned a couple of names. I, it's hard almost to believe. Yeah, yeah. Everybody was overlapping with me. Uh, Mario Draghi, Ben Bernanke, uh, Olivier Blanchard at the, at the IMF. Um, um, uh, uh, Larry Summers was at Harvard, but effectively part of the same community. Uh, Maury Ofstel later at the IMF. Uh, the basically almost everybody who was making economic policy. Um, in the last ten years, in the last uh, ten years, was was a classmate of mine, including speaking. Mario Draghi and Ben Bernanke, the two uh, yeah. chairs of the Federal Reserve and the European yeah. Central Bank, and they were all part of the same cohort. Yeah, and all all Rudy Dornbusch students. So it was this, uh, you know, uh, MIT in the mid 1970s was a kind of uh, Athens of, of international economics, if you could yeah. say, and uh, it, was, it was the right time to be there. And if, uh, if uh, MIT was Athens, then was Leuven Sparta, or? Uh <laughs> 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 well, um, I, I, I... How did you get into the international, international economics? Uh, well, I mean, again, it's more prosaic. Um, <laughs> I'm from Belgium, right, and very small country. Uh, I was not attracted at all by doing just uh, one country economics, right? A closed economy. And you, you in the US, you, you had models in the macroeconomy of closed economies. And I couldn't possibly teach uh, macroeconomics. Right. And assu let's assume we have a closed economy. Yeah, um, in Belgium, that wouldn't yeah. work. Wouldn't you, you, you could do that in, in the US, but we, I couldn't do that in, in, in Belgium, right? So, and I was very much attracted by the international dimension and what uh, happens across the borders. So that has been my main motivation. Of course, th there was not the same kind of concentration of, of people um, that you had at MIT. That's obvious. Huh? And, and but uh, I was certainly looking up, uh, for example, also to Dornbusch. Eh? You mentioned right. Rudy Dornbusch. That was a, a kind of role model, academic role, role model also for me, although I didn't know him personally. Yeah, because of course it's not uh, in the 1970s, uh, it was not uh, like today, where if you like somebody, uh, you can follow them on Twitter and you can stay abreast of everything that's, ha that's happening. How did you guys know who was the Twitter star of the, of the time? Well, we, we read this, uh, the, the articles, yeah, right? We read the we journals met in conferences. and the conferences. The uh, conferences. One of the things about uh, uh, international economics is that, that there are many, many conferences. We're not talking fancy things, and they're, we're talking about uh, very modest but gatherings, and, and they tend to be kind of the same 30 people. <laughs> and it's any given subfield, the same 30 people, yeah. uh, you know, Just are, meeting are in Milan the one month and they're in, in Bangkok the next month and so on. So it's a, um, so there's a constant in, in, in interchange of information. Yeah, of course you have to be able to enter that, that select club of, of 30 and you said that uh, you, you have a little joke about how you, how yeah. you get into that little club. Yeah, I said, so people, uh, three good papers. One paper to get people's attention second one to show that the first one wasn't a fluke, and a third one to show you have staying power. <laughs> and after that, you're, you're part of the, <laughs> the scene forever. And so, uh, and so the both of you have been part of that scene for the last uh, 45 yes. years or so. Uh, and you've actually uh, read, uh, I think, one of those papers you must have read in the mid-1970s, because uh, you said later on yeah, your work. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the, the f well, you, you wrote a lot concentrated in, in a very few I years. I mean, this. I, I, you have this theory that um, people who get the Nobel Prize actually had their ideas when they were in their 20s, right? I think you had ideas afterwards also, but it's, it was quite concentrated. <laughs> and I remember, right. and I remember um, basically two, two papers um, that um, I, I found 
fantastic and, and, and really eye-openers. One was your international trade paper, right? A new theory of international trade for which you actually also got the Nobel Prize, which was illuminating in the following sense. I was teaching international trade and in a way it was um, not very satisfactory, the standard theories, that we could actually um, say or explain why um, Nicaragua was uh, specializing in bananas, right? right. And, and, uh, and we would uh, sell machinery or something to them, right? But we had very great difficulties in explaining trade among industrial countries. And that was m where most of the action was. Happening. was. And, right. and then y you came up with, with your theory that I'm not going to explain here now, but uh, which I think influenced me a lot. And, and then, then there the was a second one. And, and, and the other one was about um, currency crisis, right? Um, so we, this was also the time we had started in Europe with the exchange rate mechanism. This was the European monetary system, right? Uh, we wanted to fix the exchange rates. Um, I had the feeling this won't work. But this was like a, a gut, feeling. gut feeling. Right. And then he had a paper, you know, with just a few equations telling us, of course it will not work if, <laughs> if countries do not commit themselves 100% in their monetary and fiscal policies to maintain the fixed exchange rate. And the example was the Netherlands, right? The Netherlands was actually following the Bundesbank. Uh, when the Bundesbank raised the interest rate, they would immediately raise the interest rate. And in other words, they abandoned any pretense of wanting to do something for their home economy. And, and Paul then Sense showed that, so with a very elegant model that if that happens, then a currency crisis will occur. And it could, you could even, the timing of this. Well, in the model it did, the, the model timing was precise, did. right? Yeah, and precise. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, it, it's funny, because uh, paying attention, I, to say the trade work, uh, we didn't say, talk about this before, but a lot of that was motivated by the example of the <coughs> growth of trade within Europe, the, with, with the formation of the common market in 59 led to this explosion of trade, Belgium uh, being a prime example. Intra-European trade. Intra-European trade, which was very difficult to explain given the standard at the time models of international trade. And so uh, it was partly this paying attention to events and then asking, okay, um, how would we think about this? And there, there were some new theoretical approaches out there that I learned about from uh, at MIT and, and it, I realized this could be applied. So, and then the, yeah, currency crises. Uh, you know, they, uh, there were, of course, enough currency crises to look at at that time. Yeah, I mean, the, the collapse of Bretton Woods itself was marked by a, a wave of, of uh, speculative runs on currencies, and that's the kind of thing that that, that, that motivated. But then, uh, yeah, I mean, I like to joke that I invented currency crises, which, you know, <laughs> not, not the thing itself, but sort of the academic field, and, and the business has been good ever since. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Although, of course, inflation now has uh, disappeared in Western markets. Um, and I, w I, I thought to mention this because uh, I wanted to ask, when did you first meet? And, and you mentioned we met at the Bellagio. And me, of course, with my limited cultural knowledge, I thought, oh, you, you met in Las Vegas? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but you were no, talking about there's uh, an actual Bellagio in Italy. This, yeah, in, in <laughs> Italy, yeah. The, the yeah, the co like uh, Garda Lake, right? Or uh, Como. Lake. Como. Como Lake, yeah. yeah, Como yeah Lake. It's a beautiful beautiful village and it's the Rockefeller Center huh? right yeah in Bellagio a beautiful villa and and I think I think that's where we first met I think uh, but there there were so many I mean yeah uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah at right. that stage of your career you're going to a different country for a, an international conference every month and it's a they all blur together and you yeah, so but everybody might knows have everybody. been another place yeah but yeah. so that was uh, at the end of the 70s that was uh, perhaps there about yeah. Yeah. yeah 79 or something or something like that yeah. I and then something interesting happens because at that point you, you come in on each other's radar and then you start to sort of read each other's paper and, and it starts to influence uh, your work. And I think that uh, Professor de Grau, you had also mentioned, I worked later on, on on the idea of currency exchanges and fixed currency exchanges. And, and some of my ideas were actually inspired by the work of, of uh, Paul Krugman. Yes, uh, as, as I already uh, told you, um, this, this model of currency crisis was of course key in understanding the nature of, of, uh, of, of crisis in the international uh, economy and especially in exchange markets. 
and um, in a way it influenced me much later um, in the sense that wh when I was thinking about uh, the monetary union, you could European also have union. similar crises. Yeah. It was a little bit different though, but, uh, but, but the fact that there are self-fulfilling things, right? And, and, and once you, you, you have that, this can uh, lead to unraveling of, of, of particular commitments like a fixed exchange rate. Yeah. And, and within, within the Eurozone, something similar happened um, during the sovereign debt crisis. Yeah. There, there's a pretty clear line of intellectual dissent from my 79 paper on currency crises to Paul's uh, incredible 2011 paper on the, on the Eurozone crisis. And uh, um, which you know, it, it's it, uh, probably influenced Mario Draghi and probably saved the euro. But anyway, the, uh, we'll uh, ask him because he has the time now. I think he <laughs> stopped uh, his job at the ECB yesterday. <laughs> well, we can, uh, yeah. <laughs> Next we time we invite him on the That's spot right. between the two of you. But, uh, but there, no, I mean, that was clear. There, there was, yeah, and it was a continuum, right? And, and yeah. interchange of views. Yeah. Now, of course, between 1980 and 2011, a lot of things happened in the international economy. Uh, in Europe, uh, there has been the creation of the Eurozone, it actually happened. Um, and, uh, and, and on an academic level, I should say, uh, in 1990 also something special happened. Uh, uh, Paul, you visited uh, the other Paul in, in Leuven. How did that uh, come about? Well, well I guess I, I, I invite, I was at that time responsible for the Gaston Eskes chair. So this was a series of lectures that uh, the Department of Economics organized, uh, funded by bankers who had set up uh, a fund to do that. And so I, I invited uh, uh, Paul to, to give the, the lecture at that moment. And, and at, in fact, at that time, I was not aware you, you were doing work on geography. Right, right? it was not published. So yeah. I sug s proposed another subject, but Paul came then with his idea, well, since I'm working on geography and trade, <coughs> that's what I want to do. And, and uh, that's how Paul then came. And these lectures were then published uh, as a book jointly by MIT and Leuven University Press. And I mean, I have become quite uh, significant. Yeah, in they were even the mentioned by the <coughs> Nobel Committee uh, that work, of course, on economic geography. Uh, for the Nobel Prize, so even though uh, you're not the professor of uh, Leuven, at least uh, the name is somewhere in the <coughs> publication <Right>. list. <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's either one or two in my Google Scholar uh, rankings. Uh, the, um, it, I mean, I had some, I was kind of working on this stuff, uh, but it was vaguely formed, and then Paul asked me to give these lectures, and I, that provided the incentive to kind of pull it together and into a story, and it, it turned out to be, uh, you know, interesting stuff, uh, very relevant for, as it turns out, for a country like Belgium, which is mm -hmm. is almost more like a, a region within the United States, but also obviously relevant to uh, to and lots of stuff. And perhaps it's useful for for the audience that we explain uh, briefly what that model was. It was about the clustering of industries in yeah. certain regions. Yeah. Uh, so, um, well, let me give you the the uh, the. You know, not the, the, the formal models, which actually were uh, more restrictive than, than what I really, th uh, so, okay. Uh, I'll give you a story here. I'm sure that you can have, you, you can give me some European examples that are better, but um, uh, if you, uh, actually, let me do this too. Um, let's ask, what, you know, right around us here uh, is this uh, enormous concentration of stuff, and particularly, um, uh, a couple of miles south of us is Wall Street, uh, and all of these, uh, you know, all of these firms uh, doing financial stuff um, in a very tight space with extremely high rents. Uh, why are they there? Why? Why? Why, why, why should do they we have all to squeeze there? in these small apartments here in New York? And and the and why do we want to do that? And the answer is that there are a number of ways in which. Uh, uh, Geographic proximity becomes an advantage. Uh, there's a classic trinity of, of things. One of them is the um, uh, uh, availability of specialized suppliers. Not sure that works too well for Wall Street, but there actually are consulting firms. But even better, actually, right where we are here is was the, 
used to be the garment district. That's right. We used to have uh, vast amounts of clothing. Not anymore. That's all moved to Asia. But the, uh, but uh, and there were suppliers of fabric, suppliers of equipment, who were located nearby, and that was a and they were, they were there because the industry was there, and the industry was there because they were there. Um, there was a. You have a thick market in people with specialized skills, so people who knew how to do particular kinds of, of, of garment, uh, you know, uh, not just sewing, but more sophisticated things. Um, and it's a real advantage to have lots of companies in the same place because if one company does well, it's able to find workers. If it does badly, the workers are able to find jobs at another employer. Uh, and then there's the information spillovers. Uh, that's a huge thing for Wall Street, just being near other, f other companies that are doing the same thing. So this, this, this trinity of motives uh, uh, leads to the concentrations of, 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 of industry. But there, um, part of the point was that there are also their countervailing forces, high rents, uh, the advantage of, of going out to closer to, to some of your customers. There's always a tension between them, and these things ebb and flow. Yeah. So, uh, um, and one of the things that at that some is point the industries decide to move out. Yeah. Is it too expensive, or they outsource some. Yeah. Many work. of the classic concentrations uh, uh, broke up. Detroit is no longer the center of the world's auto industry. Uh, the uh, if you drive into here from New Jersey to the to the Lincoln Tunnel, there's a sign on an overpass that says "Welcome to North New Jersey, uh, the world's embroidery capital since 1872." <laughs> I don't anymore. think there's anybody doing any embroidery there now. But uh, <laughs> um, but then again, but sometimes it comes back together. Come back. Right, right now, we're li living in an era when the stuff is coming back together <coughs> again. And mm -hmm. one thing, uh, maybe an urban legend that I heard, and it makes it, it, I think of it because of all the lights that I see behind us. But an urban legend that I heard was that part of the reason why you you thought about this clustering was because you looked at a map of the world it, when it was dark and you could see all these little lights and, and Belgium I think was the most brightest spot. That, <laughs> but well, that, that's but maybe the part I added. But Flanders but has changed its policy now, it's less bright now. It's, huh? <laughs> it's less right. the, the, the motorways are not illuminated <laughs> anymore. Right. anymore. But <laughs> is there anything to that story? Well I, I don't know if it started with that but it certainly is a way to see it. You just yeah. look at the, I mean if you look at, this is now because p countries are getting better about, about wasting energy, but, uh, but until quite recently, illumination was a very good proxy for Indicator. GDP. And, and if you look at a map, if you look at, at, a, at nighttime photos of, of Europe, there's nothing that hints, that hints at country boundaries. What you see is this sort of uh, banana of, of activity, which is Belgium and the Ruhr and down, down that way. And it's, uh, it is telling you that, that maybe uh, it country boundaries is not the right way to think about this and regional stuff is. The clustering, uh, you <laughs> see it there. W one of the, the great things also of this theory is the following, um, that is that e ex ante, um, it's impossible to predict where exactly the concentrations will be. Right. right. Um, you so can't predict. You, you can't predict. We know that there will be concentrations, but where exactly this will be will depend on initial conditions, things that we, we don't accidents. know, sometimes trivial, sometimes trivial things, right? <coughs> and if we were to rerun history, probably it would look very different. Maybe New York wouldn't be here, but somewhere else. Well, uh, and, and these you're things a New York matter. Do, well, do you agree with that? New York is, is here um, partly, uh, it, it was fundamental, but, not, but irrelevant now. <coughs> the, uh, the Erie Canal was built in 1815. And it was the only way that you could build a canal that would get you to the Midwest because of the geography. Mm -hmm. But the Erie Canal has not had significant commercial traffic for more than 100 years. It, 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 because of the advantage it gave New York in 1830 is the reason we have this city here mm -hmm. now. Uh, other things are really trivial examples. Um, uh, uh, two guys named Hewlett and Packard uh, did some tinkering in a garage in, in uh, in, in, in San, San Jose, Francisco. California, and, that's uh, right. and that's why Silicon that's Valley is where it right. is. Right. Uh, so, but yeah. it could have been. So the point is, if we were to rerun history, many of them would be. Then this would be. We would still have concentration, so the yeah. qualitatively would not be different, but it would be elsewhere. That's right. Other places. Does that also mean right. that you can reinvent a new uh, cluster, or uh, you know that you can? <coughs> it's incredibly hard to do deliberately. New yeah, ones do yeah. appear, but it's uh, yeah. but they just tend not to be. Um, I'll, I'll give you a, a, f a funny story. Uh, the uh, I spent, I grew up mostly in the suburbs of New York City, but I spent my first eight years upstate in Utica, New York, which is uh, is a 
you know, it is a stranded industrial city. Uh, uh, um, but not, it's in better shape than the neighboring cities. Uh, and the reason it turns out is that it is the headquarters of Chobani yogurt. Oh, yes. <laughs> and the question is, why is it the headquarters of Chobani yogurt? And the answer is that for some reason, um, a, a large group of Bosnian Muslim refugees settled there in the mid-1990s. <laughs> so people who knew yogurt settled in Utica and they so that's the kind of thing who, who could have predicted that that's but that's right. yeah that's right. now uh, at the same token uh, uh, there were 500 years uh, between <coughs> two very significant events in uh, in Leuven in 1516 Utopia was published by Leuven Press and in 1990 your paper was published well, by Leuven Press. I hope there were a few things in between <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so uh, the, uh, the, your careers l roll on and, uh, and you become active in journalism and you become active in politics, as a matter of fact, eh? because you were a senator, people forget, and a member of the House of Representatives right from after the visit <coughs> of uh, Paul Krugman until 2003. I assume the two were not uh, related, but, uh, but you were basically active in, in federal politics for 12 years. Yeah, I was eight years in opposition. That's when... Um, you have to shout all the time that whatever the government does is bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I, the last four years I was in, in, I was in government in the sense that um, my party was in, in the government. So this was a, an interesting experience. Uh, but when I think back on this, um, I'm, I'm asking myself all the time, how come it took me 12 years to find out I'm not a good politician. <laughs> <laughs> you could have saved the taxpayers a lot of money <laughs> if you... Uh well, yeah, by the way, but, but <laughs> no, but yeah, uh, I think this was, this was a very good experience for me. One, one of the things I learned, and that I, I, wanna, I wanna say is, that is the following. Um, when, when I started this, or before I started this, I had this typical view of a professor about politics, and that is that these politicians are either dumb or corrupt or something, right? Uh, um, and then I, I went into politics and I changed my mind. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, um, I found out that it's so extremely difficult to be a politician because yeah. you really have to solve a, a big, big problem. And that is that on most issues, there is no consensus in society. There are opposing interests and you as a politician has to satisfy all this, right? And you are likely to fail in the sense that many people will feel that you are a traitor. You are not doing what they want you to do. And so it's a tough job. And, and, and I must say, um, I've met lots of very nice people, also intelligent people. Of course, there are also others. Huh? I'm but that's also in academia. Huh? Politics in academia, right. you must know it better than I do, is not much different than politics. Oh, you know the old line, the uh, academic disputes are, are much especially vicious because the stakes are so small. Yeah. <laughs> this was kissing you, right? And you entered politics in a different way. Actually, you, you, you became a commentator on politics as a, as a freelance journalist or as a, as a regular journalist for uh, several publications, but most famously the New York Times, and that started in the 90s. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I was in the U.S. government uh, for one year in 1982-83, just a... Uh, Council of Economic Advisors, which was under Reagan, though I was a registered Democrat, but a technocratic role. Uh, it was a As a, uh, of course, the Council of Economic Advisors is, is a, the most senior uh, council of, let's say, economists advising the, yeah, the gov I, federal government. I was the, yeah, I was very young, but I was the senior international, and the senior domestic guy was, what was his name? Summers, Larry Summers. Don't know what happened to him. <laughs> anyway, uh, but um, but but yeah, I but I developed actually after that, I began writing occasional. Uh, things in plain English, uh, for which it turns out I'm, I'm, I'm not bad for an economist at writing things in plain right. English. And, uh, uh, and got you know, so regular once a month writing uh, first for online uh, publications and then for Fortune magazine and then uh, the Times approached me for, to write this column. So it, it uh, which was, uh, you know, it's a, that, that's, it, the Times is a very special publication in the U.S., I guess, in the world, right but in the it's, uh, here. 
Yeah. Um, although you I never. You, yeah, you, you never. Did you have a disc here or a batch here? Uh, to I enter? still did never got. I never got myself a, a, a regular building pass because I'm never here except for parties. Makes you wonder what you have to do for the New York Times to get uh, a bil building pass. What you have to do is waste four hours of your time going through a <laughs> lot of procedures. <laughs> uh, but the. Uh, but yeah, I, I started. I, and, and it's an interesting. Uh, you know, it's it's a. It, the ability to write economics for. Uh, for a broader public is related to the ability to do good economics, but it's not quite the same thing. You have to figure out, actually you have to, your audience is intelligent, but not, but always comes from, from a standing start. And so you have to find ways to avoid jargon and find ways to explain things very, very simply. And uh, that's, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a craft. It's, it's, uh, it, it can be satisfying in its own way. Yeah, and uh, I remember that a couple of times, uh, you can find it in the archive, uh, that you thought a good way to introduce a certain topic was to refer to uh, work of uh, Professor de Grau. I remember a couple of times in your column that you well, mentioned him and his work. Well, I was tremendously, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, we're not quite sure we want to bring this in, but the, uh, I mean, I was following the, I, I followed European affairs much more than most Americans uh, for a long time. I did, even the original work was, was strongly motivated by European trade and, and I followed the, the, the road to the Euro and all of that. Um, and then when the European debt crisis broke out, um, I mean, I, I had been kind of a Euro skeptic, but I have to admit I at least somewhat bought into the line that, that, this, was, uh, that this was a fundamental fiscal crisis. Uh, and then I read this totally eye-opening paper by this by Paul de Grajo, <laughs> who I'd known forever, <laughs> From uh, yeah. uh, in 2011, saying, you know, look at Spain versus Britain. Uh, fiscally, Spain is in better shape. Why is Spain in, in crisis and Britain not? And saying it, that it's, this is all about a cash flow, and it's this is it's it, Spain isn't fundamentally insolvent. It's just not getting. It, it can run out of money because it can't print its own money, and uh, and it's a self-fulfilling panic. Uh, and I was, you know, a huge booster of that, uh, along with uh, many other people. I think we were all kind of like, oh, hey, we've been reading this whole situation wrong, and uh, um, it it was, I think, probably the the single most eye-opening paper I'd ever read on a on a, a current economic issue. It's high praise. Um, mm -hmm. Also, a paper I really wished I'd written, you know, which is <laughs> the highest praise of all. I think you wrote that. Yeah, yeah I did say that. Maybe, maybe you can exchange <laughs> the papers. Uh, but then, uh, well, if if we can trade, I would take your papers and, and you can win the Nobel Prize. Well, and win the Nobel Prize. No, but no, I, I enjoyed uh, this. This, uh, not, yeah, I mean, I'm, I was very happy also that Paul uh, recognized this, and I still remember a, a blog. Well, you had two blogs that referred to that. One was you have this knack to, to have great titles. One was called Pain in Spain. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Pain in Spain. And the other one was Paul de Grauwe and uh, the Reign of Terror. Which <laughs> but that, that, that this but is no, but the rain was Oli Reign. Oli Reign. This is Oli Reign. Right, Oli Wayne was the commissioner, uh, commissioner of economic and finance in the European Commission. And he was going around in, in Europe saying austerity and the way to get out of the, of the crisis yeah. is by austerity, right? Um, and so Paul had the, the reign, but written like Oli Wayne, of terror. Yes. And contrasting this with uh, my analysis. So just to may maybe to try to, to explain what, what Paul has already done it, but um, the, the key element was that um, people, many people didn't realize that once you are in a monetary union, um, the, 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 the governments have to issue their bonds into what is effectively a foreign currency, right? uh, which is over which the, the they government has the no money. control. Because it, right. it has no central bank to back it up. Right? Um, and that is key, of course, because um, it, it means that um, an individual government cannot give a 100% guarantee that the bonds that, is, that are issued will be repaid at maturity because it's in a foreign currency. It's like Argentina issuing uh, in bonds US in dollar. dollars, right? right? Cannot really give a guarantee to bond dollars. Look, look, you can be sure you will always be repaid in dollars. Ah, what if the Argentinian government runs out of dollars, right? Um, and this actually happened within the Eurozone. I mean, we, we were all Argentinas in a certain way. That's right. right. And, and so because there was no central bank 
capable of backing up that commitment that these governments had done. And that creates then a potential for self-fulfilling crisis. There are purely liquidity crises, right? That you, people are afraid, or maybe this government, the Spanish government, may run out of, of cash, or of euros. So we, we better sell the bonds, right? And in doing so, creates the, the liquidity crisis. So how do you deal with this? Not by austerity, like Oli Wayne right. was trying to do. There's no need to do austerity. You need a central bank willing to commit itself to provide liquidity in times of crisis. And who could do that? The ECB. And, 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 yeah, then and what happened was that what Mario Draghi uh, said three words whatever it takes, which yeah. was taken to be, we will supply cash. Yeah. We will, you know, not that we will prop up a government that is fundamentally insolvent, but that it, we will not allow a European country to run out of cash and, and default on its bonds simply from lack of, of, of pieces of paper with, with bridges and doors on them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, this all started 2011, was actually preceded by another crisis, which was the financial crisis here in the US. Now, as per scientists as you were on, on the Euro uh, crisis, um, I remember you saying, um, I had not seen uh, the financial crisis uh, coming in 2008. Yeah, so, I mean, I thought, uh, uh, I thought it was obvious that there was a huge housing bubble uh, and <laughs> that it would be nasty when it burst. Uh, what I thought, did not think of, was that the financial system would prove as fragile. Uh, because we all knew about banking crises and the Great Depression, but we said, well, banks, you know, banks, uh, deposits are guaranteed, They're, they have uh, 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 discount lines with the, with the central bank. You can't have a wave of bank failures the way we had in the 1930s. What I had missed, almost everybody had missed, was that we had actually evolved a financial system that was mostly not there was mostly things that, that were de facto banks but were not legally banks, shadow banking. We had all of these things. We had the repo market. We had, that was the most important part of it. But we had all of these, these shadow banking institutions that had no safety net. And so we were in fact uh, set up so that, that you could have a, 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 a sort of high tech uh, replay of what happened in 1931 all over again. And that's, that's uh, that almost what happened. And, that, and uh, we didn't see that coming. By the way, I would say the European Europe managed to do pretty much the same thing with, with uh, you know, different details. So there was more. Uh, here it was it was uh, financial instruments nobody understood. In Europe, it was Landesbank and lending to Spanish cajas that nobody understood. Right. But uh, both of us, uh, I mean, it, it, there's been this kind of race I think over the past uh, dozen years. Of, uh, between Europe and America as to who can screw up yes. worse. <laughs> uh, and the jury's still out, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but so t 2008 was actually a, a, a terrible year for the US, but for you personally, it was, of course, uh, a fantastic year. Uh, it was the year that you won the yeah. Nobel, well, not because of the fact that it was a financial <laughs> crisis, but because you won the right. Nobel Prize uh, that year. And, uh, and, and I think a, a funny anecdote is that, uh, uh, Paul, you were asked uh, the day before who is going to win the Nobel Prize and what was your answer? Yeah, so a, a journalist uh, from the radio, Flemish radio calls me up the day before, you know, and, and asks me, ah, who will you, do you think will get the Nobel Prize? In fact, I had no clue. I, I knew, but wait a minute, I knew Paul would one day get the Nobel Prize. Oh, I has, had a, a good chance, let me put it this way. But I didn't know well, that this would be the next day, right? And then somehow I said, yeah, I had been thinking, of, well, okay, Paul Krugman, I said. <laughs> 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 yeah. And the next day it was Paul Krugman and the same <laughs> journalist calls me again, <laughs> you have some <laughs> special <laughs> links or something? How did, how did you know? Well, uh, <laughs> but you knew it. Uh, you were not, I suppose, an insider who was tipped no, beforehand. No, not at all. No, not at all. <laughs> I think. I mean, yeah. You, you know, so, so you know, some people are in the pipeline that yeah. that will may get it because it's never certain, right? You, 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 yeah. But I, Paul was one who was in the pipeline. So I flipped it out and 
Paul Krugman. Um, and then, of course, uh, you have the, the Nobel Week in December 2008. You received your prize. So you spent, uh, and, and I have to say, uh, the Campus Krant was there to observe it because I was the assigned reporter <laughs> for the Campus Krant to come and see you uh, win the, or receive the Nobel Prize. Uh, so you spent one week uh, with the Nobel Committee in Stockholm and you spent one week with Paul in Leuven. What was the better experience? <laughs> oh, in terms of, in terms of actual you know, quality of life, Leuven was immensely, they, that was actually kind of nightmarish. Uh, they, you know, they, the Nobel ceremony is not for you, it's for, the, it's for them. And uh, so I was being rolled out for event after event. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, my wife actually said, you know, there are two things about this that are great. One is it's great that you got it. The other is we will, we will never have to do this again. <laughs> uh, actually, quick story. The, they, um, you have to wear a monkey suit, right? You have to wear right. the, the funny clothes, and, uh, uh, which I didn't and don't, do not own. And so you send their, your measurements. But and but they wait, wait, hold it. The, the, some people have got the Nobel Prize twice. In different in fields. Oh yeah, yeah. What you yeah. So maybe the Peace Prize is still a possibility. <laughs> but you would, you would decline prize. it so because you, you don't want to do the week again. again no? <laughs> well, Peace Prize is given in Oslo, so that's maybe a different. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they they, they get, but you have the the, the, the starch shirt and so on, and uh, they got it a little bit wrong. It was actually a little bit big, not too not uh, small, and so it was sort of folding over, and the result was that during the ceremony, one of my buttons popped. Oof. And so I actually spent the Nobel ceremony like this, holding my <laughs> shirt together. Like Napoleon. So like Napoleon. Yeah. Uh, uh, but so, uh, I, and I remember that, uh, uh, that uh, there was a, a moment, it uh, was the, the concert in the, in the Stockholm uh, concert hall. Uh, and people were there, and after a while, people just started clapping because they thought it was over, but actually, uh, there was another uh, part of it. Do you remember that? No, I don't no. remember that. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so that, that, that happened, and then uh, we come into the last decade of uh, both of your uh, careers, and of course, uh, uh, the, the, the 2010s. And um, I wonder, now you've had such a long trajectory that you've both had, and you've written so many papers and contributed so much to uh, the economic science. Um, do you feel, if you look back at it, now, um, that there are certain things that continue to be true, and I, and I think, for example, of uh, your work on economic geography, do you see a return of economic geography? Oh, yeah. I mean, that, it was funny, because when, when I did the work originally, um, we had actually been in a period when industrial concentrations had, by and large, been diminishing, and in which region, regional disparities had been diminishing, a bit long period of convergence, um, which it turns out um, had ended, we didn't know that for a while, but it turns out that ended probably in the 1980s. And since, since the 80s, you've seen uh, regions starting to diverge again, to some extent in Europe, but especially in the United States, with the uh, uh, state, poor states had, had gone way up the scale, but have now started to slide again. Uh, the concentrations of, of activity in, um, in San Francisco, in, in, in New York, uh, um, have, Expanded. I mean, the um, uh, so I so I I, I now have this uh, position at the City University of New York, which is actually owned by the state of New York, not the city. And the reason is that New York City went bankrupt in 1975, and the, the state uh, bailed out the, the university system by taking it over. That wouldn't um, happen now. Uh, wh well, the point was that New York City was in bad shape, not only with extremely high crime and all of that, but also was economically on the ropes in the 1970s and now it's you know it's uh uh it's back it's insanely expensive but it's uh, the, it's insanely expensive because it's such an attractive place uh to do business so uh, the that the the forces of concentration seem to have had a big revival since uh, since around since the 1980s yeah um, and, is, uh, and, and that you can see, for example, in the, the technology sector, of course, where there's huge concentration, but you can see it in these superstar cities like New York and San Francisco and, uh, and a couple of other ones. Yeah, and it's, a, it's a other thing. I mean, the, so knowledge, the knowledge-based economy seems to thrive on large groups of highly educated people in the same place. That's, that's a big part of it. Um, it is also, you know, we're, we're debating them. There, there was a really good research conference at the Boston Fed just last month on all this stuff. Um, and I learned a lot. But, the, um, uh, but there are other things. The um, corporate headquarters uh, are moving back to big cities. A lot of them moved out to suburban campuses or to cheaper cities. And they've moved back to big cities. And one of the reasons they're doing that is because with modern technology, 
uh, the back office operations don't have to be in the same building. So you don't have to pay premium wages to all of the clerks. They can be out in, uh, you know, in, in, in Western Pennsylvania or something. Yep. Uh, but you can keep management and the technology team in Manhattan. And that's uh, so, you know, the, the world has changed in ways that, that seem for the and moment, it used to be, to be together, because and maybe one good example of that is actually a company that is headquartered, I believe, at least uh, officially in Leuven, which is uh, Anheuser Busch Imbev. Uh, it's one top hundred one, yeah. top one hundred executives are actually based here on Park Avenue, just a couple of oh, blocks oh, down. There we go. That's um, it. But they are just on one or two floors of a building, and for the rest, nobody is there. So that's one of those examples where you see the headquarters moving to the big city. But the beer the is produced in Leuven. Huh? Yes. <laughs> okay, well that's good. <laughs> but no, it's actually, I was, I was just trying to explain, this, uh, we, I gave a, a seminar on this stuff the, yesterday at, at, uh, at, at the Graduate Center. Uh, and the students were asking, you know, they were trying to, what, what do you mean about this, things have to be located together? And I said, wait, you, you, in an office in 1970, the corporate database consisted of a bunch of filing cabinets, right? right. And so everybody had to, to have there. access to those filing cabinets, and th that's not how things work anymore. And that's how technology is sort of helping to both yeah. recluster, but also diverge uh, uh, yeah. regions and cities mm -hmm. in, in terms of... Do uh, you feel the same about uh, your work on currency exchanges? I mean, Paul uh, said in our preparatory conversation that he was surprised twice about the Eurozone. Eh? I think you said you were surprised. I was surprised at the, at the scale of the crisis. I mean, I, I was always a Euroskeptic, but the, the way things fell apart in, in 2010, 2011 was shocking. But then the, the durability, the fact that there have it's still been... still around. It's still around. Uh, some of the countries have staged strong comebacks, but the, in particular the currency has, been, has, has held together. Uh, I, I would have expected somebody I, I thought there was going to be Grexit or something, but not, none of it has happened. Mm -hmm. So uh, would you say then uh, that your work, I mean, will we continue to see these what crises <coughs> in the Eurozone? Well, I, I think so in the following sense. Um, so we have now set up the European Central Bank somehow as a lender of last resort, right, uh, yeah. in, in times of crisis. So the, what Draghi announced in 2012 was that in times of crisis, um, the ECB is willing to buy unlimited amounts of bonds, of national government bonds, right, um, in, in the markets to, to provide liquidity, right? So a land of last resort, but this remains a bone of contention. Right. Um, when, you, when you go to Germany today, you, most German economists will tell you this is horrible. This is terrible. Draghi is, 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 yeah. is bad. That's the story. The legacy is, <laughs> That's not right. is still disputed. Because th somehow they are conditioned to think that if the central bank does that, this in the end will lead to hyperinflation. We are still waiting <laughs> yeah, for hyperinflation to, to happen. But it's, they are so conditioned to think like that. And, and, and this also determines or influences policymakers so that it's not evident <coughs> that if we have a next crisis that may occur during a next recession if it is deep enough we will have all the ingredients again right because then investors they will look around and they will see some countries hit more by the recession and therefore they will move out of these countries creating a liquidity crisis and that's when you will need the ECB to step in well, but it's not clear. It's not h sure that they will do it at that time. Yeah, I think there are two. There are two issues. There's a structural issue, mm -hmm. which is that the ECB does not, in fact, have unlimited resources because because there is no European government. I mean, the Federal Reserve actually had an agreement with the U.S. Treasury that it would be held harmless for any money it lost in in, in its operations, and uh, there is nobody to do that. I mean, the, it, w it would have to be Germany. <coughs> to stand behind the ECB and nobody can count on that. And the other is with, it, it, there's a, a personal, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we don't, you, know, it, it, you were saying you, you just, it took you 12 years to discover you were not a good politician. Mario Draghi turned out to be both a very good economist and a very good politician. Mm -hmm. uh, Christine Lagarde perhaps uh, will have, the, but we don't know that. I mean, it, it, this, was, this was one of these cases where I'm not very big on the great man theory of history, but in this case, I think the fact that, that we had the right man in the right place mattered mm -hmm. enormously. Not just, not just being able to, to diagnose the problem, but being able to bring 
often reluctant members of his board along with right. him. But that makes it fragile, right? Right. Because it depends so much on one person. And, and that's why I, I do think that in order to really embed uh, and to make the, the, monta the Eurozone sustainable, we, we are in a way condemned to move into a political union. Well, but that is not there, no. right? Yeah. I mean, that of so course, that your president of uh, your party would have said that uh, in the 1990s also. Eh? That was yeah, yeah, that. yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm deeply convinced that this is true. But, but this is now set aside. You know, now nothing really happens. And but in the end, that's the choice we will have. We will, if if we want to keep the euro, then we will have to move forward into creating a stronger political union, a willingness of governments to step in. Yeah. in times of crisis and and that's not there today right, right. Okay. and to be clear and so therefore there is still a question mark there is that sustainable in the long run i do i do hope it is but i cannot say for sure yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll have to see uh what uh, what happens but right now you judge that legacy as a positive one eh? because sure. he ended his tenure uh, yesterday and i think in the financial newspaper in belgium uh, people uh, quoted him from three out of ten to ten out of ten uh, but you both believe that he oh. did a very good job. Yeah, of course. I, I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I, I'm a little biased because I did go to school with him. At least, you know, we overlapped <laughs> a bit. But, uh, but uh, I think Draghi has a good claim on having been the greatest central banker in history. I mean, they, um, without him, the euro would probably have collapsed in 2012. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very strong statement. Mm -hmm. um, what about uh, the other uh, side of the equation? Uh, when we talk about the economic clustering, uh, uh, what do you think uh, the future is? Can we be hopeful? We are from Leuven. We heard the vice rector say uh, we are going to be one of the best universities in the world and remain so. Uh, do you think that uh, our geography is in our favor to, for that to be the case? Uh, that's, <laughs> I mean, universities are one of those things that don't necessarily have to be uh, in the, although it, it does, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it does, you can have college towns that are quite remote that can do well, but uh, it, uh, although I, I, I don't know if you guys have this problem, we, um, some of our more distant universities have, have the increasing problem of the dual career uh, household where, where the, trying to find jobs for both spouses is not always uh, mm. easy and if, you're, if you're somewhere remote. It's kind of a, a, my alma mater, Yale, has a bit of that problem because, yeah, because New Haven uh, doesn't offer the kind of depth of labor market that, uh, that some other places do. But uh, who knows? I mean, it's, uh, it, uh, I think a, a lot of it, the living is, is publicly supported, right? And then and I'm a, sure a lot it is, depends yes. upon, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, uh, by the way, I, I, we can top you. CUN, the CUNY system, it's, uh, it's, it is the public university here. It's, uh, it has, I think, 24 campuses in total. No, uh, we have only 14. Right, right. And, <laughs> and we have two, 250,000. More work 000. to do, huh? <laughs> because I, I, heard, I heard you discuss uh, when, right. when your introduction is 60,000 st uh, students, is it too right. much? Uh, but you say we've got 250,000 250, <laughs> uh, degree, uh, degree students across them, and, and it's... Uh, and but, but Paul, wha one of the paradoxes is the following. When you look at the university landscape in, in the US, the striking thing is that the best universities, the top 10, they are small. They're tiny. Not take Princeton where you were. Right, right? no. Um, they are small universities, less than 20,000 students. Um, and so that my rule in the past was any university that has more than 50,000 students cannot be a good university. That's what I thought. <laughs> we'll, we'll cut that then part of out of the this <laughs> change. <laughs> uh, but uh, there is something there that we have to explain. How come <laughs> that the top US universities are all small, relatively small? Maybe but California might be different, right? Well, but, there, but there, there are many schools. I mean, the, what, what actually happens is that the, the uh, um, there are elite uh, schools within the systems, mm -hmm. and uh, so Berkeley is part of the UC system, but is a very elite school. Right. Uh, and uh, there's nothing quite like that in CUNY, but there are uh, differences. Uh, but one of the questions is, what is education for? Mm -hmm. And uh, if it's to groom the elite, then you know Princeton is is what does it. But if it's to give uh, people a chance at, at moving up, then uh, actually it turns out, that we, as Raj Chetty and, and colleagues have been doing this work, uh, the CUNY system is completely off the charts. It's, uh, it's a successful system at uh, mm -hmm. uh, generations, including, by the way, the, both uh, myself and uh, 
Janet Gornick, who runs the program uh, at, at, that I'm part of, uh, are CUNY babies. Uh, my father uh, went to Brooklyn College, uh, or hers went to City College, and you know, because it, it has always been the uh, the escalator for for the children of of, of immigrants uh, to to make their way up and continues to play that role. Yeah. The ethnicity keeps changing. And maybe in, in Belgium it can be the same thing. Um, I want to turn to questions uh, now as we ent enter the, the, the last part of our, our discussion. Uh, before I do though, I want to ask you the one last question. When is actually the last time that both of you uh, have been in Leuven? Oh boy. <laughs> I don't believe I've been back, to be honest, uh, since, since the lectures. So perhaps uh, we should uh, change that then and uh, invite you back uh, uh, physically. Uh, when is the last time you were there, uh, Paul? In Leuven? Yeah. I still live in Leuven. Oh, unbelievable. I live, well, I, I live in two places, uh, Leuven and England. Yeah. Um, since I have a full-time job in, in, in London at LSE, the, the nice thing of a full-time job as an academic <laughs> it's is not really full-time you don't have to be there full-time right, yeah, right. <laughs> and, and so I, I'm usually two or three days uh, a week in, in in London and the rest of the time I work at home right and and, and then the weekends I am going to Leuven so I'm, I'm in Leuven much of the time. Okay, well if yeah. you ever want to see your friend uh, again, uh, then uh, you know where to find him. It's yeah. not the metropolis of London, uh, but the even better city of, uh, of Leuven in Belgium. Uh, we're going to turn to question, but first uh, I want to ask everyone uh, to give a big hand to our two guests of honor. <laughs> 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 <laughs>